Today, I'm going to interview Mark W. Schaefer. We're going to discuss his latest book called Cumulative Advantage, How to Build Momentum for Your Ideas, Business, and Life Against All Odds. The principle of cumulative advantage states that once a person gains a small advantage over others in their field, that advantage will compound over time into increasing larger advantages. In other words, the rich get richer. So Mark provides evidence, though, that and uh, using case studies and original research, that there are five factors or countervailing processes that can help anyone build momentum even without a lifetime of inherited benefits. Mark Schaefer is a globally recognized keynote speaker, college educator, marketing consultant, and author. His blog, Grow, is one of the top marketing blogs of the world. Mark's Marketing Companion podcast is among the top 1% of all business shows on iTunes. Join me today as Mark and I talk about how you too can build momentum, even without a lifetime of inherited benefits. Hi, this is Bob Poole. Welcome to the Water Cooler Hangout. For over 40 years, I've been helping people like you grow and prosper. Please join me and my guest as we share real life stories about sales, marketing, creativity, and leadership. Need help in moving to the next level? Find out how others have done it by listening to the Water Cooler Hangout. Hi everyone, Bob Poole here at the Water Cooler Hangout, and today I'm with Mark Schaefer. Good morning, Mark. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? I've never been better, in fact. How are you? I've never been better either. Good. So we're both doing well. Spring is here. The birds are singing. Yeah, and I understand you got trees falling down yeah. all around your house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had to take one down today. I'm twenty-year-old pear tree that was cracking and about to fall on the neighbor's garage. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, not good, not good. Yeah, so we took it down. So we're going to talk today about your newest book, which is uh, Cumulative Advantage. Mm -hmm. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> And it, yeah, it's, but it, it, to me, there's, I think it's a provocative title and people think cumulative advantage. Mm -hmm. What could that really be about? And it, it really um, pays tribute really to an, an idea and, uh, and a methodology and research that's been locked in the, the academic hallways of sociology for, for more than 50 years now. And it's never really been applied to our lives and our businesses. So really, the whole book is about how do we unlock these ideas and create momentum for our own world, our own lives, our own businesses, our own ideas. Well, you know, I, I read it and I started reading it and I got through the, the introduction and, and maybe the first chapter. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to give up. <laughs> I mean, I thought to myself, I, this is terrible because I agree. I mean, you didn't I, like the book? I love the book. I love the okay. book. I love the book. No, no. In fact, I think I, I wrote a review, or at least I told you. I know it brought a tear to my eye when I got to the to what was my favorite part of the book, which was the afterward, the last chapter yeah. in the book. And we're going to talk yeah. about that. But yeah, but, but cumulative advantage, it was, you know, the principle behind it from what you said is... Um, it's true. And yes. Based on what you, uh, what the Matthew principle or the Matthew effect, right? Yes. Well, this is a curious thing, Bob, that even before I wrote the book, I started talking about these ideas to people who were interested. What are you doing? So I started telling them about this idea behind the book. And when I started telling them about how momentum is built through these patterns, they got this far off look in their eyes and they thought, you know what? I never really thought about the world that way before, but it's true. And so one thing I can, I can almost guarantee is that when people read this book, they're going to see the world in a, in a new way. They'll never see the world the same way again. They'll start looking at people and looking at businesses and stories of success and thinking, yeah, I see how they had that initial advantage. Yeah. And then they saw this trend and something changed and they burst through this seam. And then they, oh, this person helped them along the way. And you start seeing that momentum, there's a pattern to it that repeats and repeats and repeats. And 
the trick is now that we know how this pattern works, how can we be methodical about it and, and make it work for our own lives and our own businesses? Yeah, I think, you know, we can say more about the Matthew effect. That basically, it's the, the, the idea is that uh, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the part where, uh, you know, I was feeling a little despondent <laughs> because, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I grew up in a family and I, and I saw it happen. And, you know, I, I had friends that came from wealthy yeah. families and saw yeah. that they had an advantage early in life. And they went off to the Princetons and the Yales. And, you know, I yeah. went off to the Navy. So <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> And I think that's one thing I, I I would really hope that people get out of the book is this idea that your your history doesn't really mean that's going to be your your future. That 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 there's nothing in this book that anybody can't do. There's nothing in this book that says you've got to have a million dollars or you've got to have an Ivy League education. There's a statistic in the book that I found particularly interesting that um, Bloomberg keeps a list of the 100 richest people in the world. And 10 of those people grew up in poverty. Mm -hmm. they, they had no cumulative advantage. They had no initial advantage. They didn't even go to college. And now they're mega, mega billionaires. And they all did the same thing. They followed these same patterns. They found some little advantage they could hold on to. They found the right trend, the shift in the marketplace. I call this a, a fracture in the status quo. And these are happening all the time. Every time something shifts in our world, and look, we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? The whole darn world is shifting. It, it, yes, it's sad. There are lots of businesses failing, but there are even more businesses starting up. Right. Uh, because there are so many unmet and underserved customer needs right now. This is a fracture in the status quo. And it's it's a period, it's sad, as I said, no question about it, but it's also an op a, a period of opportunity and hope and new ideas will flourish. And so that's what I think people are taking from this book is that this idea of building momentum is accessible to anyone if you just look at the patterns of how it works. Yeah, and you've come up with a, uh, called a system or a formula, which can help mm -hmm. people build cumulative advantage. And that's uh, without the inherited benefits that people have. And that's the, uh, that's the key thing in the book as I started reading and I was like, okay, you know, everyone does have a chance here and Mark's given them the formula. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I'm glad you, 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 you took that uh, away. And the response to the book has been overwhelming. It, yeah. it's, it's been very, very humbling, really. Because as an author, I, I put everything I had into this book. I spent two years writing and researching this book. And it was a very, very difficult book to, to write. But when it was all over, I knew I'd done my best. I knew I created something special. But you just don't know till people start to read it. And I think it's really being applied to a, a wide variety of people in life. Certainly, you can see opportunities with this book for entrepreneurs, but even people who are in like middle management at big companies are seeing now I kind of see why my department is stuck. I, I see why my career is stuck. One fellow wrote me a note and he said, you know, my company, we've been growing and we just haven't been able to get to this next level. And as I looked at your book, I realized we're stuck on step three. We're doing great on step one and step two, and but we're stuck on step three. And that's where we need to focus our effort right now. So it's providing clarity to people from a, a wide variety of places in, li in life. Yeah, and I think I, I remember you saying that uh, uh, what you call an energetic quest is what yeah. separates uh, the successful from, from the lazy. I think that was a term you used, in fact. That is definitely the beginning of momentum. And look, everybody has ideas. There are millions and millions right. of good ideas and great ideas out there. But those ideas are meaningless unless you pursue the curiosity, unless you pursue the quest. Momentum can't begin 
unless a person activates it. And there are lots of things that keep people away from that. They're, they're fearful of that or they're not confident in that. But you, if you're curious about something, that is the beginning of momentum, is pursuing curiosity and activating that idea. And one of the things I'd like people to consider is, look, when you and I were growing up in business, it was pretty darn risky to test an idea because we didn't have this thing called the internet around. You actually had to make something in your garage, right? You yeah. had to have equipment. You probably had to have you know, finances. Today, you can test lots of ideas. Uh, you, can, you can crowdsource ideas. You could crowdfund ideas. You can beta test ideas for almost no money and no risk. So the opportunity to create new value through your ideas is just spectacular. It's unprecedented. So there's no reason then not to go ahead and act on your idea. We have a cat in the background today. Yeah, I love that. (laughs) It's, uh, you know, podcasting and Zooming in the uh, age of the pandemic. (laughs) That's right. It's part of the charm. I was talking to a guy in Australia, just as a side thing here, and he said he's seen more cat butts on uh, Zoom meetings this year than in the history of his life. (laughs) Right. So anyways, so you you talk about um, the thing that separates, I think, some of these people, like the billionaires that you mentioned, the 10 billionaires, mm. uh, is something you call the, bursting through the seam, the seam. Yeah. And, right. and, and, and that's an interesting concept, one I've never heard of before. So can you can you? That's because I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh. Can you talk but, about that? Yeah. It, it, it's something that I think it's it's a very, very important part of the book. And It's actually an idea that I've been tossing around for probably six or seven years. It was actually potentially the idea for an entire book Hmm. because I think the world is really hasn't adopted this new idea of what strategy really means today. Michael Porter was a professor. I think he still is a professor at, at Harvard. He's written 20 books. He is the most cited business author um, in the world in academic papers. For many, many years, his books were the playbook for business strategy. And then in 2012, his consulting company, which helped people determine their business strategies, went bankrupt. (laughs) Couldn't pay the light bills. It's like, hey, wait a minute. What's that about? And there have been many articles and, and several books actually written about why did Michael Porter fail? And the reason is, is because uh, Porter's model basically said there are five different strategies that you can employ. You sort of pick that strategy, what's going to make your business great, and you just stick to that strategy and you plow forward for years and years and years. And he didn't really anticipate how the world of business has changed and that speed is a major factor right now. And the, and the and these seams, these fractures in the status quo I talked about, they are opening up on a daily basis and they're, they could kill your business or transform your business. They can kill new ideas or create new ideas. And so today, strategy, the best metaphor I could come up with is American football, where you've got these two teams facing off strength against strength, and the coaches are actually above the field trying to find an opportunity for progress. How can we move that ball? Is there somebody on the other side that's tired? Are they overmatched? Are they in the wrong place? Those are fractures in the status quo. Those are seams, they're openings, they're opportunities. And the idea is you burst through that opportunity as fast as you can, as long as you can, and make as much gain. And meanwhile, you're kind of looking around for the next seam. That's what really strategy is about today. It's not plowing forward with a 50 page document and a five year plan. It's what is happening now? How do we apply our core competencies to what's happening now? 
let me give you an example. I just, it was a story in the New York Times today I read about, about this restaurant in Oakland. When the pandemic hit, the owner of this restaurant thought, we're going to go under. This might be the last meal we ever sell. How are we going to do it? And then he, he looked at this as, as an opportunity. He said, what can we do? What are the skill sets we have right now? And how do we apply it now? And he looked at the restaurant and there was this, um, this lane on the street that nobody was really using anymore. And so he went to the city government. And he said, can I make block off this lane and make it an outdoor eating environment? They said, yes, boom, transformed. Right. Now you can eat outside. Boom, you're pandemic ready. He actually cut a hole in the wall of his restaurant so that people don't even have to come inside. They could hand them the meals through this hole, sit outside. Now, there's a building next to him. All these buildings are failing. The person who owns this building is desperate. And, 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 and so the owner of the restaurant said, how much would it cost to own that space? The guy's giving it away for almost nothing. So he took, he, he expanded and he said, here's what else we're going to do. People love our products. People love our sauces. They love our hot sauces. They love our barbecue sauces. We're going to start packaging these up and people can take that home. So when they came to the window, they're not just selling meals. Now they're se- giving them a bottle of sauce to take home too, that they're making in this expanded space. That's a seam. An empty lane of traffic was a seam. A hole in the wall was a seam. The opportunity to get a cheap lease. These are fractures in the status quo. He, he and, and now what's going to happen? Advantage leads to advantage. He has a whole new way to serve. He has a whole new place to eat. He has a whole new space to play with. He has new products. He has new customers because he didn't quit. He saw fractures in the status quo. Those are seams. And he burst through those seams with all his might and all his energy. Now, are they going to last forever? Mm -hmm. Probably not. But you've got to be looking for the next seam. But right now, He's making more money now than before the pandemic. Yeah. Now, great story. Great story. And, they, and I've seen it happen in, in actually in the food industry, even in Pittsburgh. There's a, a guy there that had a great uh, lunch business and mm-hmm. breakfast business and, and he got killed. You know, he's in the strip district, has a place yeah. there. Well, he started uh, he started delivering. He bought trucks. He started taking first. He was taking lunches yeah. to all the hospital workers because they all the essential workers are in the hospital. So he, he set up a thing to deliver to them. Mm-hmm. Then he was setting up tents in, in, in Walmart lots or something. You know, he was the same yeah. thing, you know, just just yeah. just said, I'm going to see this and keep and he's doing, you know, OK. He's doing when the okay. pandemic hit. I got an email from a local cattle rancher. Yeah. And the cattle rancher said, we know you can't go to restaurants to enjoy our fine steaks. We'll bring them to you. Now, when I got that email, my wife had COVID. So I wasn't going anywhere. And then she had COVID for two and a half weeks. Then I got it. Right. And I was sick for almost a month. We weren't going to the store. We didn't have any way to get food. But this guy would bring sticks to our doorstep. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was a lifesaver, right? Yeah. No. And he, so again, he 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 found a, an opportunity amid, uh, um, amid this tragedy. He found a seam and he was able to keep his business going. Yeah, you talk about a, a, another concept you call the sonic boom that kind of ties yeah. in with this. Mm-hmm. So a, a sonic boom is uh is what is is when you see this seam and explode through it is that the well if you're if you're a marketing geek like i am this is like the most fun part of the book because it talks about look if you have an idea and you have an opportunity and the opportunity is working the next step in momentum is you need to be seen you need to be heard right you need to be found and there are lots and lots of ways to do that But the value, I think, of this chapter is that I talk about 
this this being able to be seen in sort of a big explosive new way in in based on new research that shows how things really go viral it's not like what we think uh i talk about new ways to look at at, at audiences and influencers and social proof uh and, and again all these things are accessible to anyone it, you don't need a big budget you don't need uh, you know, you don't need to be a big content producer. You don't need to be well connected. You just need to know how this stuff works. So the sonic boom is th the main idea of the sonic boom is a sonic boom is a big noise that's made really fast. Mm -hmm. When a when a when a jet goes through the sound barrier, it just creates this big boom. And the the big idea here is that. When I want to be found, when I want to create momentum, let's say for one of my books, I'm not worried about six months from now. I'm not worried about a two-year plan. I need to create ubiquity as much as I can in a short, concentrated period of time with people who matter. And that's what's happening right now. I'm, I'm in the process of launching this new book, Cumulative Advantage. I'm not worried. We're, we're recording this in uh, March. I'm not worried about June. I'm not worried about July. I'm worried about right now. I'm giving it everything I've got in a concentrated period of time. And that sort of sends the snowball rolling down the hill to build momentum. That's how I launched my last couple books. And the books that I launched two years ago, four years ago, are still selling unbelievably today. Now, they're good books. You got to deliver the goods. I can't have, I can't put a piece of crap out there and, and expect people to believe in it and talk about it, but you need to get those conversations going and that's what leads to momentum. Yeah. And that's so different than the usual marketing plan. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know the, uh, the one year, two year plan that uh, we're so right. used to putting together and that, right. and that, you know, and it's, it's funny too, because I'll, I'll, I'll have people call me and even uh, clients and, They'll be like, you know, I have this idea. I talked to my bank. I'm trying to get financing. They want to see a, you know, a business plan, a marketing plan. And I just keep shaking my head and saying, no, no, that's not how we're going to do this. You know, we're going to do what you say. We're going to launch and we're going to go fast. We're going to test it. And and, and mm -hmm. we're not going to spend a lot of money testing it. You know, we, we, right. Exactly right. So, yeah. And you can, like you said at the beginning of this conversation, you can test and test and test. And, and it's uh, it, it doesn't cost you a lot of money these days to do that. Yeah, but you, you need to be intellectually honest. And, and that is a big hurdle for people that they're too in love with their own idea. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're taking too much of their own medicine and they're not really looking at the feedback. They're not listening to customers. And, and then they're just going to go down this path and eventually self destruct. Yeah, I loved it. You called it the doom loop, as I recall. Yeah, the, do the doom loop is a term created by Jim Collins. Um, I believe it was in um, the Good to Great book. Um, and what Jim talked about was that when things go wrong, and they always go wrong, little things happen like a pandemic, mm -hmm. yeah. and people tend to panic. And momentum is created through this advantage and the advantage leads to more advantage. It builds and builds and builds. And if you play your cards right, you can really create unstoppable momentum that separates you from your competition. But the doom loop is, all right, something goes wrong and you lose sight of what started that momentum for you in the beginning. You lose sight of why customers love you why they why your competitors fear you why people love talking about you and bring their friends to buy whatever you're selling and you start panicking and thinking i've got to change i've got to shift i've got to pivot and i'm not saying don't be aware don't make you know smart decisions but in in the pandemic if your idea still works the goal right now is make it through a year get to the other side, land on the other side. Don't do anything that's going to jeopardize your momentum uh, because you're afraid or, or you know, you're panicking. We're going to get through this thing. And if you can land on the other side, you're going to keep the momentum going. 
if you make decisions that detract from your core advantage, then you're going to be a, a, a me too product. Uh, you're going to be just like everybody else. You're going to lose your competitive advantage. I shouldn't say me too. That's taken on another meaning these days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, but you're going to be just like like everybody else. And you need to t- you need to be clear about what brought you there, what got you there, why customers love you, what is your core competency, and you know stick to it as long as you can. Keep going through that seam. Yeah, you still have to, uh, even though you can test things quickly, you still have to uh, spend the time building, uh, you know, your network especially. I think I don't, when you, you and I, I, I don't know, I imagine at some point earlier in your career, you had a Rolodex. Mm-hmm. And you probably yeah, actually did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all did. They, uh, that dates me, I guess. <laughs> we all had a Rolodex. You know, it's one of the greatest things in the world was to have that Rolodex. You're probably still using some of those names today. And, and you, you, yeah. you know, that's where you can test things. You can build your, you know, you find mentors and, and like you call it your Da Vinci group that you put together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's just you, you still need that. So I want to go backward just a little bit to the scene thing, because I have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen here. So. What, how do you t- how do you find the seams besides paying attention? Uh, what what do you do to pay attention? What would you tell them if if someone's looking to they want to look for the seams for something new? You know, I I, I just think that if you're a, a curious person, you're going to be seeing these all the time. Okay. Um, and and what you need to be aware of is when you see a shift, if you see something different, something you don't understand, a new trend, then you think, okay, does my idea apply to this? How does my idea apply to this? How does my core competency line up yeah. right now? Yeah. Now, yeah. let me give you a little example of how, how I applied this in my own life. As I mentioned early on when the pandemic hit, you know, we had the sickness hit our house. It hit me bad. I had hypoxia. I wasn't getting enough oxygen to my brain. So for about three weeks, I couldn't think, couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't do my business. I was out of it. When I finally sort of woke up out of this fog, I realized my business had gone to zero. I was a teacher without classes. I was a keynote speaker without an audience. I was a consultant without customers, even my book sales had gone to almost zero overnight. And I was disoriented. And I had to figure out where do I fit in this world? And what I realized was, here's a shift. Here's a scene. What is my core competency? I am a teacher. I'm a teacher in everything I do. A podcast, a blog post, a speech, a book. I'm a teacher. But the world needs me to teach something new right now. I need to shift. I need to take my skills, my advantage, and apply it to what the world needs right now. So I stopped creating all the marketing content I was creating, and I started creating new content about how do we get through this thing? How do we deal with this disorientation? How do we deal with uh, this chronic uncertainty? How do we assess our core competencies and apply them to what the world needs right now? And, and, and my, the, the traffic on my blog tripled. Mm-hmm. It tripled. So then I took the content that I was developing and I turned it into a white paper uh, called Fight to the Other Side. Here, there, here are the practical things that we need to do right now to, to fight to the other side. And I turned the white paper into a speech that I was then able to, to sell to different companies who are struggling with these questions. How do we get to the other side? How, do we, how does marketing work right now? How does sales work right now? Right. And I was able, and, and by June, I was having a record month. Great, great story. So, can we talk about my favorite part of your book? Sure. The after. Chapter 10. The, the after. The after. No, not chapter 10. Is it, is it 10? Yeah, it's, uh, okay. it's the afterwards. It is 10. It is 10? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, yeah, just fantastic. You know, how, how did you, I mean, no book that I've ever read ends that way. I mean, right. it either starts that way and, and continues or, yeah. you know, but ends that way. No. And no, and if no one's, you know, listening right now, they, they, they don't know what we're talking about, of course. Um, yeah. So how would you describe it? I would describe it as somewhere in the last year, you had a, um, a vision, something that changed your life. Maybe it was the COVID. Plus, mm -hmm. at the same time, you also have been working with a uh, disadvantaged young man and mm -hmm. his family. Mm -hmm. And you saw things coming together and you said to yourself, you know, there is such a thing as... Um, uh, and, and when you're talking about having cumulative advantage, there's also cumulative disadvantage. Yeah. And I, and I think you, this, I'm, I'm reading your mind here after reading the book, but I'm thinking you saying, yes, there's cumulative disadvantage and we have to do something about it. We can do something about it and I'm going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so you set out here to talk about what we can do to help people like Elijah, the, the young man that was there that you've been helping and you have a great story uh, in there about junior achievement, which I think we had to talk about. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was, uh, uh, you want to change the world and you're doing it one step at a time here today with this book. Yeah. And I think you're changing it. Well, thank you. That's, that's probably the best compliment I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. Yeah. So write that down somewhere. <laughs> So I can save it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's recorded. We got it. So you got to tweet it out. Talk to Mark Schaefer today. And I told him he's changing the world one step at a time. Yes. Well, the, look, um, here's my, the realization. This is the, the angst I had while I was writing this book. And I had two audiences in mind as I was writing this book. It's about building momentum. And the, and the premise is, look, anybody can do this. Anybody could do this. You don't need to have a million dollars. You don't need to have a Harvard education. You can build momentum. And in the first audience in my mind was someone like you, people who, has enjoy, who have enjoyed my other books, people who enjoy my, my blog, people who trust me and listen to me. And then the other audience I had in mind were these families in, in, in disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods. The family that I work with, work, that I work with is in the middle of, of gangland. It's in the middle of the most dangerous part of our city. We, in fact, we've just gone through a horrific few weeks where teenagers are getting shot by random bullets. Mm. It's horrific. And this is where you know, my family lives and I, and I worked with this family for 13 years and uh, the matriarch of the family, the grandmother recently wrote me a note um, thanking me for, for my help on something. And she said, we are family. You are my family. We will be together until we die. She is my family. And they're, they're living in the middle of gangland. And so this, I could not be intellectually honest with myself and think this book will help them. The answer is no. And here's why. Every business book, every self-help book is by its nature elitist. It assumes someone has the money to buy that book, that someone has the time to read that book, that they have the resources. And the skills to activate ideas in that book. And it's just not true. And I realized I am writing an elitist book and I can't do that. I need to say what needs to be said that there are parts of our society that this doesn't apply to. But now that we have cracked this code, I spent two years thinking about how does momentum work? And we realize that every time it starts with this initial advantage. It could be a helping hand. Right. It could be encouragement, direction. This is something all of us can do. It's accessible to all of us. And there's plenty, plenty, plenty of examples where 
sometimes we don't even realize the impacts that we have that send a ripple through history, that send a ripple through the world. We all have the power to do this. We can't change the economic disparities in our country. We cannot solve social injustice, but we can take one step. We can lead with love. We can, instead of lending a hand, we can be the hand for somebody and just send that ripple of momentum forward. We all can do that. And that's the message that I, I, that I end the book with. I was startled by a statistic that 60% of the variance in IQ is attributable to, uh, my tongue's tied here, is attributable to socioeconomic status. Yeah, it's literally home to environment. environment. Yeah, environment, home, yeah, nutrition. And the children, they, they, they have this, the children four to six living in poor conditions who were adopted into, uh, uh, you know, enriched living conditions experienced an IQ increase from 77 to 91. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's an amazing thing. It's 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 breathtaking. It's breathtaking that just 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 getting just having food and have and, and getting enough sleep and feeling safe can transform your IQ. Yeah. And that I mean that's the, you know that's initial advantage, isn't it? Moving from a 77 to a what was it, 91 or 92? 91, right? yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and look, you know, not all of us can, can adopt a child and provide that kind of environment, but it just shows the power of, of just, of, of just having fundamental, um, living conditions on how that can send a ripple through the world. Yeah. And you, you provide a, a list of resources in the book that people yeah. can go to. Well, what I, what I did was. I mean, one of the themes that I, I, I went down a lot of deep rabbit holes on this book, Bob. And yeah. I, I mean, I talked to civil, civil rights activists, community people who are fighting for children, fighting for a better life, better education, better opportunities for children. I talked to a woman who's been a teacher and a principal in uh, an impoverished school district for more than 30 years. And I asked them, what gives you hope? And, and basically they all said the same thing. They said, look, we are where we are. The issues are cosmically complex, but our children can make the difference. Our children are the hope. And what's gonna make a difference in our children is when they believe they can make the change. They believe that they are worthy. And they are surrounded by the people and the resource to nurture that initial advantage. All right. And I heard this over and over again. And so what I did was, okay, if someone wants to get involved in something like that, what does that mean? Where do you go? And so I reached out to some of my friends who are in that business of, of vetting the very best resources uh, to say, okay, you know, here are some places we can get involved. Anybody can, can, can do it. Um, and, and everybody can find some resource based on where you are in your life right now. Maybe you can't donate a lot of time, but you can donate a little wisdom. You can do a little mentoring. You can donate a little money. Um, so there are lots of ways to, to make those changes. Yeah, I, I, I like the story of junior achievement of the high school down and outside of Atlanta that uh, Junior Achievement came in and uh, how, how everything changed by giving the kids. They, what a story uh, of hope. Yeah. What a story of hope. Self-esteem. Yeah. They, they, I mean, Junior Achievement, I think, is a great, great program that you don't hear much about anymore. Well, there's, I think, I think <laughs> using the terminology from my book is they're starting to apply their core competency to new seams. Right. To, to new needs, uh, to shifts, and 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 they're starting to see um, that the the real change that they can they, that they can be making is reinforcing these these new skill sets, this new idea of of worthiness and confidence in these young people, and they've created an entirely new program to do that and. 
They started in Atlanta, but they're rolling out to more schools. They have a very ambitious goal to be in thousands of schools in the next 10 years uh, in some of the poorest neighborhoods in, in the country. And when you read this story, it is inspiring. It is mind blowing that they went into this, this horrific, horrific school where everybody literally has lost hope. The, the school is just a blight uh, on the community. And now they're outperforming some of the best schools in the, in the state. Right. They've got a higher rate of kids going to college than the national average. It's absolutely amazing. And they did it with, you know, basically volunteers. That's the whole key. It's not a lot of money. It's not new books. It's not new facilities. It's people creating sparks of hope in other people. We can all do that. We can. And you've done it in this book, Mark. Uh, I, I want to thank you personally. Uh, no, thank you, Bob. Yeah, I mean, people need to buy this. People need to read it. And uh, it's not just, it's it's the, the greatest uh, ending to a business book I've ever read. So <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah. Like I said, I did have a tear in my eye <laughs> when I yeah. finished it. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Bob, as always. Thank you, thank you for your generosity, your kind words, and, and your support today. I really appreciate it. 